Uh, hi, so this is Hero, and he's been making uh, all us programmers' lives better by working at Travis CI. And uh, if you know what I'm talking about, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so um, he's uh, here for the second time, so apart from everything, apparently he likes it here in Bulgaria. And uh, he's, been, he's going to talk to us about uh, programmers rolling dice. So let's give him a hand and see what this is all about. Hello. Ah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is my second time in Sofia. I'm happy to be back after two years. As Bobby was saying, I work for Travis CI, and I am a developer there. I use a lot, do a lot of things, and I do support as well as development. When I do support, I hear a lot of things, right, when things go wrong. People will tell me how broken Travis is. I hear something like that or something like that. And I say, huh, that's very curious, because that's not how computer works. Whoops. By show of hands, how many of you have said something similar? Oh, my tests are failing randomly. It works on my machine. Why can't it not work on Travis? Yes, you're all guilty, yeah? Because what it means is that you're treating your computer like a black box that you don't know anything about. Right? When you see something that you do not understand, what was it? My, hello? Am I clear? Yes, yes, okay. If you don't understand something, it is very tempting to say that I don't understand, something is random. And for the most part, it is not true. Something can be random and mysterious until you really know something. Mute. <laughs> Something as mysterious as solar ex eclipse can be random until you know how exactly things work. Right? Imagine being in the second century BC, before uh, the common era began. It is reported, I have not confirmed, that Chinese astronomers were tasked to predict a solar eclipse, and they failed to do so, and they were killed by the emperor at the time. I don't know if this is true or not, but imagine the power that you're going to have if you could predict solar eclipse back then. Today, we know a lot more about solar eclipse. We can measure a lot of things more accurately, and we can predict the next time that you're going to see one in 2030. Right? You will see the Sophia being marked there, and you will see that uh, it is partial eclipse that you're going to see. At the turn of the century, no, that's not true. Uh, the turn of the century before that, there was a, a French physicist named Pierre Simon Laplace who said that if it is possible to know the position and the velocity of all the particles in the world, you could understand that what happened before, since the beginning of time, and what will happen till the end of time. This is called Laplace's Demon. If you want to read that, you're welcome to do it, but it's in the Wikipedia, so I'm not going to read it here. So randomness is exactly, not exactly random when it comes to computer. 
If you know everything about the computer and its environment, it will produce the same result every single time. This includes the famous fly on the logic board. I hope this is, um, I, I hope this is, this is a well-known result. Yes, this is the first bug. Why it's called bug? Yes? Okay. Oh, there was, oh yes, the, this is the first time it was caught. All right. <laughs> All right, so what does that mean? We have random test fail, failures. It means that we don't understand something, right? What does that often translate to? It could be hidden uh, updates and dependencies. Your code may not have uh, uh, changed, but your underlying dependency might. For example, N NPM uh, updated to a new version, or Rails uh, updated from four to five, or something like that. Or it could be segmentation fault, uh, memory is corrupt, uh, for the reasons that we don't know, but th it is deterministic. Uh, or it could be that your program is running on a, re um, a shared resource and your neighbors are tr uh, interfering with yours. Your test might be running on a Docker container, but Docker container is just a program uh, for the host, right? So if the host misbehaves, or the con other containers on the same host misbehaves, your container could be affected. Or your tests might be order dependent and you just don't know about it. And when we, or Travis, or any other CI service runs your tests in random order, random order, I'm gonna get to that, your tests might behave differently from the way that it they do on yours. And the list goes on. Well, it's all nice and good, but what if, what, what if you do want something to be random? What does it mean to be random in a computer? If you're a programmer, you are undoubtedly uh, familiar with something like this. On Ruby, you have a random module, and you can just call rand on that to get a random number. Or if you're a Python programmer, you can get a random random. Or if you are a Go programmer, you can get a math rand, and, or PHP, you can get rand. And or C, you can just call rand in standard library. Um, if you call this function uh, on C, it is deterministic. Did you know that? The number that you're gonna get is 16807, and it's the same all the time. It's not random, but it is, sort of. You can ask DuckDuckGo <laughs> for a random number. It says uh, it's a random number between zero and one, probably uh, one exclusive, but you're probably not gonna get 1.000 or 0, 0.000 anyway, so it probably doesn't matter. I don't know what, what this uh, number is, but you can uh, refresh the page to get a different number. There is also a website dedicated to randomness called random.org. Let's see, this is not very visible, but if you look at the uh, post request getting sent, it is api.random.org, right? And you can see the result at the bottom. It's a little... Uh, uh, small, but the, uh, it will. It gives me uh, 23 random integers from the pool 
of minimum zero to maximum 365. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But these are not the only kind of randomness that we can talk about, right? And coins are a often a very good um, randomizing device. I have a small coin here. I'm going to ask someone to come up on stage. Volunteer, please. All right, I'm going to be the volunteer, I guess. There is a, a side with number 20, and the other side with a horse and a, what is this, rat? No? What is it? That's a Bulgarian coin, I think. Oh, it's a horse. Horse on the bottom? What, what is the animal on the bottom? It's a dog? Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to call, well, it is supposed to be heads and tails, but they are not heads and tails. So number and the horse. All right, I'm going to flip the coin, and I'm going to ask one of you to uh, record them. Okay? How about you? Can you do that for me? All right. I'm going to flip a coin. Horses? Or just one? Horse and dog and a man, a person. Horse. It's a number. Number again. Number. Horse. Number. Horse. How many throws did I do? Eight or oh, eight. Okay, two more. All right, let's do some more. Horse and number. So the, uh, the ran uh, question that I'm going to ask you is: Was it random? How how many of you think it was? Okay. How many of you think it was not? Good, because I like your suspicion. <laughs> because I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know that I called the, all the numbers correctly? Or that the coin was fair to begin with? Or the recording was done correctly either. All these things can affect randomness that you perceive, yet you have no proof whatsoever. Right? So what, what do we need to do in order to determine randomness or how good a random number might be? How random a number that you were given as random number might be? What you need to know is the ideal that you have. Well, thank you. How the ideal will behave and determine how far away or how close we are from that ideal. For all intents and purposes, we're going to start with this uniform distribution function where if the random number that we're going to have falls between the interval A and B, then the value is 1 over B minus A. Otherwise, 
the value that we're going to get is zero. And for uh, computing simplicity, we're going to take a to be zero and b to be one. And we have the unit uh, uniform distribution function. This is very important, and we can build other uh, random variables by scaling up or scale shrinking or uh, th things like that. Right. How does this behave? Well, we don't know, um, but there is a fundamental result in probability theory called uh, central limits theorem, where if you average those up, if we have a random variable, if you average them, it's going to behave like the normal distribution. The normal distribution looks like this, the uh, so-called bell curve. If you look at the, the average of the number of heads that we co collect with 10 throws, you would expect how many heads? Five, right? But it doesn't happen all the time, right? It doesn't happen all the time. If it did, it's predictable and it's not random, right? And one in uh, 1,024 times, you would expect all heads or equal frequency, all tails. That's what randomness means, right? You expect that to happen. And if you don't, then you would reject that random variable as false, right? But overall, if you average them up, if you take the average, it's going to look like the bell curve, right? You will have something on the uh, far left side with zero tails and the maximum number in the middle with five heads. What did I say? Zero tails, five tails in the middle, and ta 10 tails on the far right, right? That's what randomness means. Okay? If you don't get this, you probably don't have a random thing. So what do we need? We need a model of randomness like that. Right? That's one way that we can determine whether or not what we have to consider is random. So let's get back to the unit interval, because this, as I was saying, this is a, a fundamental building block. There are many ways to think about this randomness. And as you build your arsenal to determine whether or not something is random, you come up with clever and interesting things to um, uh, observe and reject or accept. The first problem is called um, birthday problem. And it's uh, stated like this. We have a group of n persons, and what is the likelihood, p, of having at least two of them sharing the birthday without considering the year? Okay? We're going to assume that we use the Gregorian calendar from January 1st to December 31st, including February 29th. And we also assume that they're all equally likely. This is not true statistically speaking, but for the sake of our argument, uh, we're going to say that they're all likely, okay? All right, so this is, uh, I think, a well-known problem. And to get to P equals 0.5, 50%, you only need 23. If you have a group of 23 people, that's, uh, the full football match with one referee, chances are that two of them share the same birthday. If you are a betting man, betting person, sorry, getting the one-to-one uh, -one odds, you will be making money long term. <laughs> with n equals 367, we get P equals one, right, by pigeonhole principle, right? If you cannot have any other way, 
Okay, that's the basic result in combinatorics. But to get to 99.9%, .9%, you only need about 70. This, I don't know if this is high or low for your uh, intuition, but it seemed very, very low to me at the time. But you can look at how the probability can be computed, and here we are. After 60, everything is almost 100%. Right? Why is this important? There is an interesting uh, application in cryptography where a hashing function can be thought of as a birthday. Right? If you have a big uh, possible values to uh, choose from, it is hard to get the same hash value. Right? You want the hash value to not collide. And if you have easy hash function to uh, collide them, and then you have a very insecure hashing, and you can be fooled by something, uh, someone that has malicious intent. Oh, well, are there any other interesting properties about random numbers? There are, of course, I'm talking about them. Let's take uh, five num random numbers, n1 through n5, and we order them by value and repeat. Each of the five factorial permutations should occur in equally likely frequency. Right? So you have n1 greater than n2, greater than n3, greater than n4, greater than n5. I am not considering any of them being equal because we have random uh, distribution and we have zero possibility, virtually zero possibility of coming up with two identical values. That ordering happens at the equally likely frequency as n1 greater than n2 greater than n3 greater than n5 greater than n4 and so on and so on. This is very difficult to read, right? Did I cheat? Do you trust me? All right, let's use the uh, more visual representation with hearts. Blue, green, no, sorry. Uh, blue, red, green, yellow, and black. And I am going to translate this ordering into colors, and I think you are more trust, trusting of me now uh, about what I'm saying. Okay, we can continue in this way, and we have had uh, many uh, scientists and uh, statisticians and uh, mathematicians uh, working on this problem which was first uh, proposed by Donald Knuth in his seminal book, The Art of Computer Programming. And over the years, um, statistician, I believe, uh, George Marsaglia of Florida State University uh, came up with Die Hard, the test of uh, randomness, and published it in 1996. And Presumably, he also published a CD-ROM, if you remember CD-ROM, with random numbers. <laughs> True story. And there is a new uh, test suite called Die Harder, as one does, uh, by um, uh, Duke University physicist uh, Robert Brown. And there is also one um, proposed by Pierre-Luc Luc Lecure and Richard Simard, I think, from uh, Montreal. I'm not going to go through uh, any of these things, but the, uh, you can look at, find the sources to uh, run the tests and the pseudo random, random generators that come with it. All right, so as I was saying, when it comes to computer software, that behavior is deterministic. The, if you have the same input, it will produce the same result. Okay? The result may seem random to you, 
or to the program that is looking at the result, but they are not. So th these are some of the uh, uh, software random number generators. Middle square method is one of the first one that is proposed by John von Neumann, um, I think 1950s, uh, where you take a random seed of uh, not integer with n digits, let's say four, one, two, three, four, let's say, right? If you square them, you would most likely, not always, get eight digit number. Yes? More or less. If it's not eight digits, you're going to pad with zeros. And you're going to take the middle digits, middle four digits in this case, and use that as the seed to the next round. This is very, very insecure, very, very non-random, and it is very, very bad, but sort of worked for the purpose that John von Neumann was using it for. The next one is libc, uh, that's a standard C library, uh, has a RAND function. Uh, if you recall, I showed one uh, code segment like that with a C, and it turns out uh, PHP's code that I showed also uses libc. And this is also insecure because it's very, very uh, predictable. If you observe enough of these numbers, you know what is going to come next. The Melsen Twister is an improved version of it, and it is used in many of the programming languages that I uh, mentioned. Um, I believe uh, the Rubies, the Pythons, and I think Go's too, uh, but I did not confirm. And PHP also has a Melsen Twister version of random function called mt underscore rand, uh, but it is also not secure. And finally, we have cryptographic, <coughs> sorry, cryptographically secure random number generators. These are uh, random number generators that goes slightly beyond what, what we have talked about. There are two characteristics that are important uh, when you consider uh, CSRNGs, CSRNGs, meaning that no matter how much you know about the, uh, what the random number generator produced, you cannot predict the next one. Okay, this is important, right? If you're cryptographically speaking, you want to attack uh, the, uh, the function, you want to predict somehow. And the way it generally happens is that we want to look at the history and look at pre predict the future. This is not happening in uh, CSRNG. Likewise, if the part or all of the uh, CSRNG is compromised and revealed to the attacker, the attacker cannot produce the next result. Okay? These are very hard to uh, come, come up with, and this is uh, very important when it comes to cryptography. Okay, so there are other things that we can use as sources of randomness. Instead of software, we can look at hardware. Havge is one of the first ones to come up with this, and Havge D uh, is uh, improved version of the algorithm that basically takes the uh, hardware uh, states like CPU's temperature or uh, things of that nature to uh, uh, add as the seed for the random number that you're going to come up with. And there is a, the problem with these things is that the CPU status may not be known to the user like you, and you might not be trustful of these things. And there are people who would like to do that with open source hardware uh, called run, uh, one RNG, 
And I have one connected to my computer right now, and I'm going to show uh, something like that in a very quickly. Oops. Okay. I have a. Oops. That I wanted to avoid. Ah, you know what? I think I'm going to do this. Okay, I have a Ubuntu uh, VM running on my machine, and if I could show you the LED on the on the board, it, it is dimming right now because entropy on that machine is getting uh, drained by uh, catting the uh, the random device bits here. But as you recall, the title of this talk is. Do programmers roll dice? And we will. Okay. Okay, here I have a program that will do j just that. A little clumsy. I need to restart this. Sorry. Okay. So this is what what's happening here. There is a camera here pointing downwards, and I'm going to roll a die. Okay, and the program will. Uh, it's not looking. <laughs> it is supposed to detect the 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 pips on the uh, dice face, and it's just going to tell you what I rolled. You can see that the uh, software needs some improvements. <laughs> ah, it's not reading the right number. No! <laughs> the lighting is a little off, and the higher contrast will help me here, but it is not working too well here. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? That's okay. The, uh, um, the program uh, takes the difference between the initial uh, image and the roll that I'm rolling, and I can't change it in the middle. And you can see how this might be very time consuming <laughs> and inefficient, but if I did it right, you can see that there are a few random bits uh, getting produced and recorded. Yes? <laughs>
All right. So how, how we did it was that when, when I roll a one, or some approximation thereof, I recorded two zeros. For two, I recorded zero one. For three, I recorded one zero, one one, zero and one in that order. And if you roll enough of them fast enough, you may be able to come up with a uh, good random number generator hardware random number generator of your own. So in conclusion, when you hear somebody say something is random next time, take, take a step back and say, I don't think so. Because it is a time to be curious, time to be doubtful, and time to learn something new. I'm going to end this talk with the uh, 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 quote from John von Neumann. And whether or not this endeavor is worthwhile, uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and uh, I think I have maybe a few minutes uh, for questions. <laughs> Brogo Dari. All right, thank you, thank you very much.